Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about, um, talk through Haberman's section 4.3, which is exploring um, some of these other boundary conditions that we can have, let's say, um, uh, for the wave equation. Okay. So let's get started. Um, right, so of course, wave equation to time derivatives. Okay, so we have we'd expect two um, initial conditions kind of for the time behavior, um, but we also have two spatial derivatives. Um, and so, as in the heat equation, we expect um, two pieces of boundary information or two boundary conditions um, to uniquely determine a solution. Okay, and so some of the easiest boundary conditions are. You know, zero boundary conditions. And so these look like, right, the value of your function at the left and right endpoints is zero. Um, we would interpret that as the string is tied or fixed at both ends. Um, but what, what you can do is have a slightly more general boundary condition where instead of right, tying the string kind of down to you know, height zero at one of the endpoints, Instead, what you can do is say, well, the string is actually, you know, able to move at one of these endpoints. Okay, so maybe you're holding the string and you're, you know, making it move, um, or possibly we have it tied to a um, a spring system. Okay, and so kind of the rest of this, like all of this section is looking at um, what that looks like if one of the ends of your string is attached to the end of a spring um, and some consequences of that. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna suppose, so say we have a string, okay. Um, one end of the string is gonna be tied down um, kind of the height zero. Um, and then the other end is gonna be, have this sort of dynamic boundary condition where this dynamic condition satisfies some sort of um, spring behavior. Thing. Um, so what, what is the picture for this? So let's say this is height zero. This is going to be the value for u of l comma t. And then maybe on the other side, uh, I should have started up here. We have a string or a spring, and then maybe that's our string. Okay. Um, so over on this side, this height is this value that we're, that we're going to call y of t, which is exactly um, the value of the function that we're looking for. You have zero comma t. Um, and so that's the height of the end of the spring, kind of above. Right, height zero. We also have um, kind of the, the height of the base of the spring. So this is going to be y sub s of t. Okay. Um, the length of the spring when it's unstretched, that's this quantity L. Um, and then finally, the spring has a mass, say m, okay, the top of the spring where our string is attached. Okay, um, so those are some of the physical quantities kind of, of interest. Um, and then, moreover, right, since you know we're looking at how a spring is behaving, um, kind of to, to describe that motion using, say, Newton's laws, um, we need to incorporate this quantity called Hooke's constant or kind of the spring constant coming from Hooke's law. Okay, and so what that looks like is, so say Hooke's law says um, mass times the acceleration, this is gonna be minus K times the displacement of the, of the spring. Okay. Um, and so of course, the displacement in our case is going to be more than just the height, right? Because the displacement depends on the entirety of the spring, which may not be stationed, um, stationed at height zero. 
Um, but we have this restoring force, right? This spring constant right here, where the larger the value of K, the more kind of restoring force your system feels. And so the more, um, you know, your spring is going to get pulled back down to a um, unperturbed or unstretched configuration. Okay. Um, so, but so yeah, so this is our setup. So, right, the question is, we want to describe the motion of this particle right here, or the kind of this mass. And of course, the motion of this mass, um, you know, is really what the height is. So Hooke's law says, well, the forces acting on this mass just coming from the spring, um, they satisfy Hooke's law. And so they look like this, where you have, um, so this quantity right here is the entire length of the spring, okay? And it may be stretched. And then what you're looking at is, right, how stretched the spring currently is um, and how far away that is from kind of the unstretched length, okay? Um, so this is kind of the, the, this is the displacement of the string, or of the spring. And then Hooke's law says, right, some of the forces you feel are going to be minus k times that displacement. Okay. Of course, we may have other forces in play. Okay. So maybe there's gravity that's acting on the mass. Okay. Um, another possibility, and one that we'll account for, is well, uh, the string right that we're working with has tension in it, and so that tension is also pulling pulling this mass. Okay. Um, yeah, so let's look at what those, those forces look like. Um, so the kind of uh, tensile forces or tension forces or how, whatever you want to call them, right? As we saw before, so the magnitude of that tension vector kind of acting on that mass, um, that magnitude we're calling T of zero comma T. And we want the y component or the vertical component of that force. And so that quantity is this um, magnitude times sine of the angle that kind of the force is you know, making or acting on. Um, okay, and so then we were making these very much like physicists approximations where you say, well, for a small angle, sine is approximately tangent. Okay, what is a tangent? that angle, well, that's approximately the gradient or the derivative of kind of the profile of the, of the string. Um, and so then we're also saying, well, for the strings that we care about, the this uh, tension force is going to be constant throughout. So we're going to replace this, you know, possibly variable um, magnitude right here. We're going to replace it by a constant. Okay. So the vertical component of this tension force, which started off with this, we had very hand wavy physicists interpretation. And we ended up with, well, that force, that tension force is just this quantity, this constant T zero times the derivative at that point. <clears throat> and then of course we can have other forces like gravity or you know, whatever else. Um, and so, we're just going to have this kind of black box catch-all force that we'll call G of T. Okay, so um, kind of looking back from this slide, right? So, so far, right, the motion of, of this, this mass or this particle is described by Hooke's law plus these other forces, which for us are uh, kind of the tension forces and then black box that generally includes gravity, but may include other, other properties. Okay. All right, so putting this together, so, um, right, two slides ago, this quantity was d squared y um, dt squared or y double prime, okay, but our setup, um, right, y of t is exactly the value u of zero comma t. So we've plugged in u of zero comma t there. Um, this is Hooke's law, again, where we've plugged in u of zero comma t for y of t. Otherwise, we've added in the tension force, and we've added in this other black box. 
Okay. And so one quick note is, right, because of how we've set this up, um, kind of the this tension force that we're working with is going to have this positive sign. If you uh, kind of work these boundary conditions so that instead of evaluating at x equals zero, you, you evaluate at x equals L, um, this sign is going to flip because um, kind of the that tension force, that vector that we're working with, the action gets flipped. Um, but in any case, so this right here is the ODE for our boundary condition. Okay. Um, and so in the most generality, right, this is the ODE you need to solve for u of zero comma t. But then keep in mind that, right, u of say x comma t is governed by another differential equation. Okay, so in general, sure, this is how it evolves, but it may be actually a fairly complicated system of equations to solve. Okay? Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to make some assumptions about, you know, maybe some stuff that might actually happen and then see what the consequences are. Okay. So the first assumption we're going to make is, well, if the mass is sufficiently small, okay, so maybe you have a string and it's just tied to the end of a spring. Okay. Um, so effectively there isn't that right mass that's, um, same, yeah, coming into play. So that means that this term here effectively goes to zero right, because mass is effectively zero. Okay. So that's one, uh, one assumption that we're going to look at. Another assumption we're going to look at is, well, this other, this black box for any other forces like gravity, we're going to ignore that. We're going to assume that there are no other forces. Okay. So maybe the weight of the string and these other properties, just gravity isn't, doesn't have an effect. <clears throat> and so what that means is this term, this is zero. Okay, and so what we're left with is minus K times this, this whole thing, plus T naught times this derivative, all of that's equal to zero. Move this to the other side, the sign flips, okay? And we're left with this expression where what we've done here is taken um, kind of this y of s plus l and just call that this e sub e, which you can interpret as um, kind of the position of the mass or the end of the spring um, relative to kind of the, the x axis. Right? So, in particular, right? So, if y sub s is negative, so if the base of the string, string is spring, if the base of the spring is below height zero, right, then this is gonna have a negative sign. And so then plus the length of the spring, you're gonna end up above um, kind of the y equals zero. Um, and then that's gonna be, uh, position of the mass relative, yeah, to the x-axis. Without accounting for um, kind of the perturbation of, or kind of where the end of the um, spring is. Okay, anyways. <clears throat> Mathematically though, this is this is the expression that we're, we're looking at, right? So constant, some constant times the derivative, is equal to some constant times the value of the function minus some constant times this other presumably given function. Okay. okay. I mean, so one thing to consider is, right, well, what if this equilibrium position is zero? Okay, so maybe drawing the picture again. All right, so this was y sub s of t. And then this would be the mass. And then we're interested in the height of the, of the string, right? So if the length, kind of if, if where you are, 
um, where the base of the, of the spring is plus the length, if that's zero, right, then kind of the unperturbed spring is kind of the end of that spring is exactly at height zero. And so then in that case, um, kind of oops, right here is where the equilibrium position for, for the um, kind of this mass, the end of the spring would be. Um, and so in particular, yes, if this quantity is constant is equal to minus L, so that kind of the spring is just sitting down here and the mass is right there. That's a you know, situation that maybe we're a little more comfortable with visualizing. But okay, anyways, mathematically, this is the thing that we're looking at. Okay. Um, and so one question is, well, what if you have a free end, right? So in some world, suppose this string, right? One end of the string is not attached to anything, okay? Um, how would we even start to model that mathematically? Um, well, we can actually get that from kind of what we just put together um, by using the same approximation of m equals zero, right? So zero mass, no other forces. But then what we can do is say, well, this spring constant k that's telling us kind of how resistive or um, right, what this restoring force of the spring is, if, there, if the spring doesn't actually have any restoring force, right, that corresponds to k going to zero, okay? So if we look at this equation again, right, well, if mass is zero, so we just have the string tied to you know, the spring and the mass, this whole term is zero. If k is zero, then this whole thing is zero. And so then we're left with t zero times du dx value at zero from t, all that's equal to zero, okay? So kind of our approximation for if you have a free end of the string, what is the corresponding boundary condition? That's, that's going to be this, which is the same boundary condition we had for you know, the heat equation with perfectly insulated ends. Okay? Turns out that this condition, the derivative is zero, also describes, um, I mean, it also comes up in the wave equation, but it describes something slightly different, right? Now you have this free motion of um, the end of a string, which I guess if you look at the profile of, you know, solutions to the heat equation, especially equilibrium solutions, you're requiring them to be flat at the ends and sure it can move freely, but as long as it's flat and it's essentially what's happening here as well. Okay, so that's it on these dynamic boundary conditions.